This is a very realistic war movie where we see four American Sherman tanks slowly advancing along a muddy road. On the roadside, an elderly woman is seen slicing meat with a machete. In this wartime era, scarcity made food incredibly precious. Even a fallen warhorse would be salvaged by starving civilians. But staying alive, no matter how tough, was still better than death. German civilians killed by the Nazis were ruthlessly hanged from telephone poles, with wooden signs around their necks bearing humiliating words. I am a coward and unwilling to fight for the German people. This was the Nazis doing. An American soldier speaks they have come to German soil to wipe out the last of the Nazi forces. In April 1945, the Allies were penetrating the heart of Germany, while a desperate Hitler launched total war. To make up for the shortage of soldiers, women and children were sent in large numbers to the battlefield. Some civilians unwilling to fight were killed by the Nazis and hanged on the roadside to serve as warnings. This inhuman behavior only accelerated Hitler's downfall. The movie portrays the Nazis' final madness in a disturbingly realistic way. On a battlefield not far from Berlin, a German officer on horseback leisurely surveys the quiet field. But as he passes near a tank, danger swiftly closes in. The ambush is led by American Sergeant Don, the tank commander. His tank, Fury, suffered heavy damage in battle, resulting in the death of a crew member. To leave the battlefield quickly, their loader and mechanic, Raccoon, is busy repairing the tank. Soon, once the tank is mobile again, driver Gordo starts it up and they depart, eventually reaching a rear camp. This camp serves as a place for resting after battle and for treating the wounded, as well as holding numerous Nazi prisoners. These prisoners never expected to face such devastating losses in their homeland. They can only watch in frustration from behind barbed wire. After Fury arrives at the camp, the crew members carry their fallen comrade out, covering his body with his clothes. It is their last sign of respect for him, but with one man down, the tank's combat effectiveness is reduced. Fighting on German soil, there are no more experienced tank soldiers to replace him, so their superiors assign them a new recruit to fill the gap. Norman, originally a typist, had never even seen the inside of a tank and was brought along to make up the numbers. Don's team, upon seeing the newcomer, decides to give Norman a proper lesson. They hand him a bucket of hot water to clean the inside of the tank. What seemed like a routine task wiping off some blood to prepare him for the brutal reality of war turned out to be much worse. Among the blood stains, he finds half a crushed human face, causing Norman, who had never seen anything like this, to crawl out of the tank and vomit uncontrollably. But when he raises his head, he realizes that what he saw was only the beginning. The dead soldiers' bodies are scattered, with hardly any intact. This horrifying sight helps Norman start to grasp the brutal reality of war. Once the tank is resupplied with ammunition and personnel, Don receives a new combat mission. The five Sherman tanks head slowly northward, passing many displaced civilians along the way. Don, ever cautious, reminds his men to stay alert, as there could be Nazis among the civilians. Fortunately, they face no trouble, but Norman notices a girl pushing a bicycle, and her delicate face stirs feelings in him. His comrades, However, quickly douse his budding affection with cold reality, telling him that a single chocolate bar could get her to spend the night with him. Seasoned soldiers, they are indifferent to such sights they've seen it all before. While they chat about amusing encounters, the tank reaches the edge of a small forest. Suddenly, a shadow darts through the trees. Norman instinctively grips his machine gun, but as he sees the figure more clearly, he hesitates for a few seconds. His hesitation allows a Nazi soldier to launch a surprise attack. When Don finds the dead German soldiers in the forest, he realizes they were just children, but that doesn't excuse Norman for not firing. Though Don is furious, he doesn't punish Norman severely, letting the incident pass. With the death of their lieutenant, Don takes command and continues leading the remaining tanks forward. They soon reach their destination, where Don is supposed to rendezvous with the captain before heading to the next town. However, a platoon of American soldiers is surrounded by Germans and needs Don's tanks for rescue. After learning about the German firepower, Don leads the tank team to a field. Although the field is open, there's a small forest ahead. With the enemy's firing positions unknown, Don has the infantry dismount first. Then, the four tanks advance side by side. 
using their metal armor as a shield for the infantry against German machine gun fire. As the tanks continue rescuing the trapped soldiers, German soldiers in the trenches launch a sudden attack. Once these Germans reveal their positions, the tank cannons make quick work of them. The German anti-tank guns in the forest aim at their targets, firing two rounds but missing both times. Instead of dealing heavy damage, they only reveal their location. After taking out one anti-tank gun, they find there's still another in the forest. It's unclear if the Nazis were overconfident or just unskilled, but despite ample time to prepare, they missed their shot. The four tanks aim and fire simultaneously, wiping out the threat with high explosive rounds before a third shot could be fired. With no more threats, the tank machine guns unleash a relentless barrage of bullets, pinning down the Germans in the trenches. Even though the Germans attempt to use Panzerfausts to destroy the tanks, they are quickly stopped by the machine gun fire. The remaining Germans, defenseless against the tank's firepower, are helpless. Looking at the dead German soldiers, the veteran soldiers tell Norman to shoot the corpses as a precaution, but he hesitates, driven by his own beliefs. Don, as the commander, is unhappy with Norman's reluctance. He brings a captured SS officer and hands Norman a pistol, instructing him to kill the Nazi. But Norman can't bring himself to kill a surrendering prisoner. His psychological defenses are slowly crumbling, but even if he refuses, Don has a way to make him comply. He forcibly grabs Norman's hand and makes him pull the trigger. In war, no matter who wins, the psychological scars of the soldiers remain. Seeing his comrades fall one by one only deepens their hatred. With this forced action, Norman starts to understand Don's reasoning. Nazis are like irredeemable demons. They kill their own people who refuse to fight and hang them high as a warning to others. This is the Nazis' last desperate act of madness. The tank team eventually reaches the target town. The streets are eerily quiet. So they approach an old man to ask for information. The remaining Nazis fiercely resist in the ruins. But against the tank cannons, they stand no chance of turning the tide. Though a few Nazis hide in the corners, their attacks only take out a few isolated soldiers. Once the tanks respond, a single shell can take down several enemies at once. But it's not over a corner reveals another ambush with anti-tank guns. However, the Nazis' aim is poor. Don quickly adjusts his aim and fires an incendiary round, striking the target. The Nazis inside the building scramble out, their wool uniforms igniting, and they suffer intensely from the searing heat. The nearby soldiers watch with a twisted satisfaction, wanting to see the Nazis suffer. What's surprising, though, is that Norman, who had been too afraid to shoot before, finally pulls the trigger. Though the bullet goes through the Nazi's body, it reveals a lingering trace of his compassion. Don understands Norman's intent. The fact that he fired shows that he knows his stance. Perhaps seeing their fellow men burning, the Nazis in the building finally surrender. Among them are several Hitler youths, no older than children, forced to fight by the SS. Upon learning it was the SS who conscripted them, Don immediately picks up his weapon and shoots the SS officer. With that, the threat in the town is eliminated. The soldiers are granted a short reprieve in the town, but Don's keen eyes spot something unusual. A woman cautiously lifts the curtain, and as she glances at the soldiers below, Don catches sight of her from the street. He and the new recruit, Norman, enter the building, brusquely pushing open the door. The woman's nervous expression does not escape Don's notice. He pushes her into a corner and quickly moves to the bedroom. With his veteran's intuition, he finds a young woman hiding. As he closes the door, the woman grows even more frightened, but Don doesn't act harshly. Instead, he calls the girl over and takes out a small tin containing a few eggs. He gestures for her to make lunch, handing her two packs of cigarettes to indicate she should prepare herself. With no choice, she accepts the cigarettes. As the two women begin making lunch, the sound of a piano breaks the tension between them, perhaps because of their similar age or shared interests. The young woman lowers her guard, approaches Norman, and softly sings along with him. The music, tender and beautiful, allows Don, who has endured so much, to briefly save her life's peace. The young woman accidentally catches sight of Don's badly scarred back, causing her to gasp and stop singing. Despite the language barrier, the two young people are attracted to each other's talent and beauty. To break the awkwardness, Norman takes her hand and pretends to read her palm. Outside, Don waits quietly, enjoying the calm. But in wartime, such moments are luxuries. Soon, Don receives a new mission. This time, the task is different. Don and his four tanks are to hold a crossroads. If the Germans break through, it will devastate the supply lines for the entire division. With four tanks, they might stand a chance. But while advancing, 
They come under heavy fire, one shell instantly destroys a tank, forcing everyone into battle mode. But Don, with his combat experience, realizes it's not an anti-tank gun ambush. It's a German Tiger tank. The crew grows tense, and Don orders a smoke shell to block their sightline. They retreat while firing, but though they hit the Tiger, its thick armor shrugs off the shell. In contrast, Don's tanks have nowhere to retreat. To avoid staying on the defensive, Don orders the tanks to encircle the enemy from both sides. Even when they hit the target, the Tiger's armor deflects the shot. Then it's the Tiger's turn to strike. Though slow and heavy, the Tiger's firepower is unmatched. When it locks onto a target, survival is almost impossible. Two shells later, Don's left with just one working tank. It wasn't a flaw in their tactics the Tiger tank is just that formidable. Its only weak point is the rear armor, which is slightly thinner. To tackle this formidable enemy, Gordo maneuvers to the rear. The Tiger tries to reverse, but its weight makes it sluggish, giving Don a chance to target the rear. A shell from the Tiger nearly wipes them out, but they finally reach its blind spot. The gunner aims, but the tank's movement causes him to miss. One shot fails, so he reloads and fires again, this time landing a fatal blow. The Tiger is immobilized. Unable to move even an inch, Don looks back at his fallen comrades, now having to face an even more powerful German force alone. Their radio was destroyed in the fight, leaving them isolated. Despite this, they continue toward their objective. When they reach the crossroads, they're about to set up an ambush when they hit a landmine. The explosion not only destroys the tank's tracks but also damages a supporting wheel. Don orders the crew to repair it and sends Norman to a nearby hill to keep watch. Hours later, Norman spots a German battalion approaching and quickly reports to Don. The Germans arrived faster than expected, and with the tank still unrepaired, the other soldiers suggest hiding in the woods. But Don refuses. His orders were to hold the crossroads at all costs, not wanting his men to die needlessly. He tells them to leave, planning to complete the mission alone. The crew, realizing they can't persuade Don, choose to stay and fight alongside him. After all, abandoning a comrade could mean a lifetime of guilt. Don is grateful for their loyalty. Knowing the mission is likely fatal, he takes out his treasured bottle of whiskey. They share it, savoring this last moment of peace before the storm. Soon, the Germans reach the tank, assuming it's abandoned. Climbing onto the abandoned tank, they're ambushed by the crew inside. Gunfire erupts as they use the tank's solid armor and cannon to repel the Germans. The fight continues until nightfall, with the Germans surrounding them. As they set up machine guns, the crew fires back, depleting their ammunition. With the machine gun clip broken, the gun jams, throwing smoke grenades outside. They exit to retrieve the spare machine gun, but the Germans close in, and as Don runs out of ammo, he uses his rifle as a club. He's injured by a German soldier and forced back into the tank, where he finishes the attacker with his knife. After a brief respite, they're resupplied with ammo, and the Germans are scattered again. Realizing a direct assault won't work, the German commander orders his men to use Panzerfaust rockets against the tank. These weapons, specifically designed to destroy tanks, allow the Germans to approach, though most are cut down by machine gun fire. One soldier, however, successfully launches a Panzerfaust, piercing the tank's armor and killing the loader. With the tank critically damaged, the Germans close in once more. In the chaos, they run out of ammo again. To resupply, they head outside once more. But with Germans all around, their driver is soon hit by gunfire. Though not fatal, he clutches a grenade with the pin pulled, but fails to throw it. With no other choice, he covers it with his body, taking a bullet to the eye. Now, only Don and Norman are left. Don's machine gun is powerful, but not enough to withstand the sniper's precision. Wounded by several bullets, he crawls back into the tank. Norman, still unscathed, starts to panic. He wants to surrender, but Don tells him about a hidden escape hatch. Don can't bear to see him surrender, so he allows him to leave. Norman's fate now depends on his luck. German soldiers climb onto the tank and toss in grenades. Norman escapes through the hatch, just as two explosions end Don's life inside the tank. After confirming the end of the battle, the German soldiers regroup. One soldier, however, spots Norman hiding under the tank. He shines a flashlight on Norman's young face. Perhaps seeing Norman's harmlessness, the young German soldier decides to walk away. Norman survives, and as dawn breaks, he returns to the tank. He finds Don's lifeless body, drapes a jacket over his head as a final sign of respect, and holds his commander, deeply mourning him. Lost in thought, Norman hears footsteps outside the tank. Instinctively, he grabs his pistol, ready to fight to the end. But when the hatch opens, it's an American soldier. Norman is saved, and as he's pulled into a rescue vehicle, he's hailed as a hero. 
Ironically, his escape has turned him into a legend. Sitting in the rescue truck, he stares at the wrecked Fury tank. If not for Don and the crew's sacrifice, they would not have defeated hundreds of German soldiers, and Norman would never have survived to become a hero. I'm a movie enthusiast. Please subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you next time.